Hi everyone, I'm back and I'm here to read you the next chapter in Mary Poppins. I hope that you really have enjoyed the story so far. I know we just got into it. We'll have to be thinking about what kind of snack we can make when we get to the end. I bet we'll get lots of ideas as we read along. But first, I'm going to read you a poem and it is by Shel Silverstein. Remember, he wrote The Giving Tree and he wrote our lunchtime poem, Hug a War. Today, I'm going to read you the poem called Band-Aids. Band-Aids by Shel Silverstein. I have a band-aid on my finger, one on my knee, and one on my nose, one on my heel, two on my shoulders, three on my elbow, and nine on my toes, two on my wrist, and one on my ankle one on my chin and one on my thigh, four on my belly, five on my bottom, one on my forehead and one on my eye, one on my neck, and in case I might need them, I have a box of 35 more. But oh, I do think it is sort of a pity I haven't a cut or a sore. <laughs> I love that poem. It would be funny to wear lots of Band-Aids if you didn't even have one cut. All right, so today's chapter is called Chapter Two, The Day Out. Every third Thursday, said Mrs. Banks, two until five. Mary Poppins eyed her sternly. The best people, ma'am, she said, give every second Thursday and one till six, and those shall I shall take, or... And Mary Poppins paused, and Mrs. Banks knew, knew what the pause meant. It meant that if she didn't get what she wanted, Mary Poppins would not stay. Very well, very well, said Mrs. Banks hurriedly, although she wished Mary Poppins did not so know so very much more about the best people than she herself did. So Mary Poppins put on her white gloves and tucked her umbrella under her arm, not because it was raining, but because it had such a beautiful handle that she couldn't possibly leave it at home. How could you leave your umbrella behind if it had a parrot's head for a handle? And besides, Mary Poppins was very vain and liked to look her best. Indeed, she was quite sure that she never looked anything else. Jane waved to her from the nursery window. Where are you going? She called. Kindly close that window, replied Mary Poppins. And Jane's head hurriedly disappeared inside the nursery. Mary Poppins walked down the garden path and opened the gate. Once outside in the lane, she set off walking very quickly as if she were afraid the afternoon would run away from her if she didn't keep up with it. At the corner, she turned to the right and then to the left, nodded haughtily to the policeman who said it was a nice day. And by that time, she felt that her day out had begun. She stopped beside an empty motor car in order to put her hat straight with the help of the windscreen in which it was reflected. And then she smoothed down her frock and tucked her umbrella more securely under her arms so that the handle, or rather the parrot, could be seen by everybody. After these preparations, she went forward to meet the matchman. Now, the matchman had two professions. He not only sold matches like any ordinary matchman, but he drew payment, pavement pictures as well. He did these things turn about according to the weather. If it was wet, he sold matches because rain would have washed away his pictures if he had painted them. And if it was fine, he was on his knees all day making pictures and colored chalks on the sidewalk and doing them so quickly that often you would find that he had painted up one side of the street and down the other almost before you'd had time to come around the corner. And there is the match man. And he is drawing with chalk on the sidewalk. On this particular day, which was fine but cold, he was painting. He was in the act of adding a picture of two bananas, an apple, and a head of Queen Elizabeth to a long string of others when Mary Poppins walked up to him, tiptoeing so as not to surprise him. Hey, called Mary Poppins softly. He went on putting brown stripes on the banana and a brown curls on Queen Elizabeth's head. Ahem, said Mary Poppins with a ladylike cough. He turned with a start and saw her. Mary, he cried. And you could tell by the way he cried it that Mary Poppins was a very important person in his life. 
Mary Poppins looked down at her feet and rubbed the toe of one shoe along the pavement two or three times, and then she smiled at the shoe in such a way that the shoe knew quite well that the smile wasn't meant for it. It's my day, Bert, she said. Didn't you remember? Bert was the matchman's name. Herbert Alfred for Sundays. Of course I remembered, Mary, he said, but... And he stopped and looked sadly into his cap. It lay on the ground beside his last picture and there was tuppence in it. He picked it up and jingled the pennies. That all you got, Bert, said Mary Poppins. And she said it so brightly that you could hardly tell she was disappointed at all. That's the lot, he said. Business is bad today. You'd think anybody'd be glad to pay to see that, wouldn't you? And he nodded his head at the Queen Elizabeth. Well, that's how it is, Mary, he sighed. Can't take you to tea today, I'm afraid. Mary Poppins thought of the raspberry jam cakes they always had on her day out, and she was just going to sigh when she saw the matchman's face. So very cleverly, she turned her sigh into a smile, a good one with both ends turned up, and she said, That's all right, Bert. Don't you mind. I'd much rather not go to tea. A stodgy meal, I'd call it, really. And that, when you think how very much she liked raspberry jam cakes, was rather nice of Mary Poppins. The matchman apparently thought so too, for he took her white gloved hand in his and squeezed it hard. And then together they walked down the row of pictures. Now, there's one you've never seen before, said the matchman proudly, pointing to a painting of a mountain covered with snow and its slopes sl simply littered with grasshoppers sitting on gigantic roses. This time, Mary Poppins could indulge in a sigh without hurting his feelings. <gasps> oh, Bert, she said, that's a fair treat. And by the way she said it, it, she made him feel that by rights, the picture should have been in the Royal Academy, which is a large room where people hang the pictures that they have painted. Everybody comes to see them, and when they have looked at them for a very long time, everybody says to everybody else, the idea, and my dear. The next picture Mary Poppins and the matchman came to was even better. It was the country, all trees and grass and a little bit of blue sea in the distance and something that looked like Margate in the background. My word, said Mary Poppins admiringly, stooping so that she could see it better. Why, Bert, whatever is the matter? For the matchman had caught, cold, had caught hold of her other hand now and was looking very excited. Mary, he said, I got an idea, a real idea. Why don't we go there, right now, this very day, both together into the picture, eh, Mary? And still holding her hands, he drew her right off of the, right out of the street, away from the iron railings and the lamp posts, and into the very middle of the picture. Poof! And they were there, right inside of it. How green it was there, and how quiet and what soft, crisp grass was under their feet. They could hardly believe it was true. And yet here were green branches, huskily rattling on their hats as they bent beneath them, and their little colored flowers curling around their shoes. They stared at each other, and each noticed that the other had changed. To Mary Poppins, the matchman seemed to have brought himself an entirely new suit of clothes, for he was now wearing a bright green and red striped coat, and white flannel trousers, and best of all, a new straw hat. He looked unusually clean, as though he had been polished. Why, Bert, you look fine, she cried in an admiring voice. Bert could not say anything for a moment, for his mouth had fallen open, and he was staring at her with round eyes. And then he gulped and he said, oh, Golly! That was all. But he said it in such a way and stared so steadily and so delightedly at her that she took a little mirror out of her bag and looked at herself in it. And she too discovered she had changed. Around her shoulders hung a cloak of lovely artificial silk with watery patterns all over it. And the tickly feeling at the back of her neck came, the mirror told her from a long curly feather that swept down from the brim of her hat. Her best shoes had disappeared, and in their place were others much finer and with large diamond buckles shining upon them. She was still wearing the white gloves and carrying the umbrella. My goodness, said Mary Poppins, I am having a day out. 
So still admiring themselves and each other, they moved on together through the little wood till presently they came upon a little open space filled with sunlight. And there on a green table was afternoon tea. A pile of raspberry jam cakes as high as Mary Poppins waist stood in the center and beside it, tea was boiling in a big brass urn. And best of all, there were two plates of whelks and two pins to pick them out with. And there is their tea. Strike me pink, said Mary Poppins. That was what she always said when she was pleased. Golly, said the matchman, and that was his particular phrase. Won't you sit down, madame, inquired a voice, and they turned to find a tall man in a black coat coming out of the wood with a white table napkin over his arm. Mary Poppins, thoroughly surprised, sat down with a plop upon one of the little green chairs that stood around the table. The matchman, staring, collapsed onto another. I'm the waiter, you know, explained the man in the black coat. Oh, but I didn't see you in the picture, said Mary Poppins. Ah, I was behind the tree, explained the waiter. Won't you sit down, said Mary Poppins politely. Waiters never sit down, madame, said the man, but he seemed pleased at being asked. You're whelks, mister, he said, pushing a plate of them over to the matchman and your pin. He dusted the pin on his napkin and handed it to the matchman. They began upon the afternoon tea and the waiter stood beside them to see that they had everything they needed. We're having them after all, said Mary Poppins in a loud whisper as she began on the heap of raspberry jam cakes. Golly, agreed the matchman, helping himself to two of the largest. Tea, said the waiter, filling a large cup for each of them from the urn. They drank it and had two cups more each, and then for luck they finished the pile of raspberry jam cakes. After that, they got up and brushed the crumbs off. There's nothing to pay, said the waiter, before they had time to ask for the bill. It is a pleasure. You will find the merry-go-round just over there. And he waved his hand to a little gap in the trees, where Mary Poppins and the matchman could see several wooden horses whirling around on a stand. That's funny, said she. I don't remember seeing that in the picture either. Ah, said the matchman, who hadn't remembered himself. It was in the background, you see. The merry-go-round was just slowing down as they approached it. They leapt upon it, Mary Poppins on a black horse and the matchman on a gray. There they are. And when the music started again and they began to move, they rode all the way to Yarmouth and back because that was the place they both most wanted to see. When they returned, it was nearly dark and the waiter was watching for them. I'm very sor sorry, madame and mister, he said politely, but we close at seven. Rules, you know. May I show you the way out? They nodded as he flourished his table napkin and walked in front of them through the wood. It's a wonderful picture you've drawn this time, Bert, said Mary Poppins, putting her hand through the matchman's arm and drawing her cloak about her. Well, I did my best, Mary, said the matchman modestly, but you could see he was really very pleased with himself indeed. Just then, the waiter stopped in front of them beside a large white doorway that looked as though it were made of thick chalk lines. Here you are, he said. This is the way out. Goodbye and thank you, said Mary Poppins, shaking his hand. Madame, goodbye, said the waiter, bowing so low that his head knocked against his knees. He nodded to the matchman, who cocked his head to one side and closed one eye at the waiter, which was his way of bidding him farewell. And there Mary Poppins stepped through the white doorway and the matchman followed her. And as they went, the feather dropped from her hat and the silk cloak from her shoulder and the diamonds from her shoes. The bright clothes of the matchman faded and his straw hat turned into his old ragged cap again. Mary Poppins turned and looked at him and she knew at once what had happened. Standing on the pavement, she gazed at him for a long minute and then her glance explored the wood behind him for the waiter but the waiter was nowhere to be seen. There was nobody in the picture. Nothing moved there. Even the merry-go-round had disappeared. Only the still trees and the grass and the unmoving little patch of sea remained. 
But Mary Poppins and the matchman smiled at one another. They knew, you see, what lay behind the trees. When she came back from her day out, Jane and Michael came running to meet her. Where have you been, they asked. In Fairyland, said Mary Poppins. Did you see Cinderella, asked Jane. Huh, Cinderella? Not me, said Mary Poppins contemptuously. Cinderella indeed. Or Robinson Crusoe, asked Michael. Robinson Crusoe, puh, said Mary Poppins rudely. Then how could you have been there? It couldn't have been our Fairyland. Mary Poppins gave a superior sniff. Don't you know, she said pityingly, that everybody has a fairyland of their own? And with another sniff, she went upstairs to take off her white gloves and to put the umbrella away. But um bum that's the end of that chapter. Tomorrow is chapter three, and it is called Laughing Gas. So I bet that there's going to be some funny stuff going on if they're going to be laughing. All right, I will talk to you later and I hope that you have a wonderful day.